Often when discussing the obesity crisis facing the United States, especially when I'm pointing out another failed effort to help people change their eating habits, it feels like there's nothing we can do. But sometimes it's actually more like there's nothing we will do. There's a difference. That's especially true with the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP. That's the topic of this week's healthcare triage. The Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, colloquially known as food stamps, provides funds to poor families in the United States so that they can buy food. Right now, more than 47 million Americans are participating in the program, with the average household receiving about $255 a month. Ironically, food insecurity in the United States is associated with obesity. Many have hypothesized that this is because calorie-dense food is cheaper than nutrient-dense food, meaning that poor people find it more difficult to eat healthily. Simply providing money for food won't change this fact. In studies, people receiving SNAP tend to be more obese than those who don't. This has led some to call for a reduction in SNAP benefits, claiming that the program is causing obesity. That's unlikely to be the case. Given that food insecurity in general is associated with obesity, it's much more likely that being poor and the price structure of food is to blame. If that's the case, we may need to change the behavioral economics of food, not the funds we supply. A very recent study adds weight to this hypothesis. Researchers gathered adults in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area who were earning 200% of the federal poverty line or less and who were not already enrolled in the SNAP program. All of them received a debit card with money for food, much like in SNAP, but then they were randomized to one of four groups. The first received a 30% financial incentive to buy fruits and vegetables. The second was prohibited from buying sugar-sweetened beverages, candies, or sweet-baked goods. The third got both the incentives of the first group and the prohibitions of the second, and the fourth got none of these and served as a control. They followed these groups for three months. They found that, compared to the control group, those in group three, incentives plus prohibitions, consumed about 96 fewer calories per day, 64 of which were discretionary calories. They also reduced their intake of the prohibited foods and increased their intake of fruit. Interestingly, those in the incentive and prohibition only groups didn't see significant differences. It seems like a combined carrot and stick approach was necessary. The good news is that this serves as a model by which we could move forward. There seems to be something we can do. The bad news is that we likely won't. There have been many, many, many calls for the SNAP program to try and promote more healthy diets. Many states have requested waivers that would allow for restrictions on what benefits can purchase. All of these have been rejected by the USDA. The reasons for doing so are not difficult to understand. The USDA harbors legitimate concerns that restricting SNAP could increase the stigma and embarrassment already associated with the program, driving away potential beneficiaries, some of whom are children. Some items, like alcohol, tobacco, and household supplies, are already prohibited, however. The USDA favors incentives rather than exclusions. The study I discussed would argue that they don't work alone, though. Most importantly, they may be concerned that these changes unfairly target poor people. In that respect, their concerns are not entirely unreasonable. Sometimes the same people calling for restrictions on SNAP are the same people trying to reduce benefits overall. They're also often fueled by anecdotal stories of people abusing the program to buy luxury items like lobster, filet mignon, and crab legs. When we move beyond anecdotes, however, data show that they're not favoring shellfish or steaks over ground beef. But not all pushes come from those who seek to punish the poor. New York City asked the USDA for permission to restrict purchases of sugar-sweetened beverages from SNAP as part of a two-year experiment and was denied. They've been on the cutting edge of banning unhealthy foods like trans fats and sugar-sweetened beverages for all, not just for some. These same concerns seem oddly muted when we look at other federal programs. The Women, Infant, and Children's Program, or WIC, provides food to poor women both during and after pregnancy, their infants, and their children. The restrictions on food in that program are quite thorough. The school lunch program helps provide meals to more than 31 million children each school day. The regulations that govern what's allowed and prohibited under that program are complex and vast. Legitimate concerns exist as to how we might change SNAP in order to improve its ability to improve health. We must be vigilant to make sure that attempts to alter the program aren't punitive to those who receive benefits. But we already qualify what children can eat from federal benefits. We already qualify what women can eat while pregnant and after. 
Evidence shows that similar qualifications might improve what people eat on SNAP. The authors claim that this is the first experimental study of its kind to look at whether restricting food on SNAP might lead to positive outcomes. It seems there may be something we can do. The next question is whether we will. Healthcare Triage is supported in part by viewers like you through Patreon.com, a voluntary subscription service that allows you to support the show through your monthly donation. We'd like to thank our research associates, Joe Sevitz and Karen Green, and our Surgeon Admiral, Sam. Thanks, Joe and Karen. Thanks, Sam. More information can be found at Patreon.com slash Healthcare Triage.